So if anyone thinks that Israel's establishment in 1948 was just plain sailing and it was just a smooth transition after the horrors of the Holocaust, would be grossly mistaken. Israel survived and was established against the odds and cheated death many times in her establishment. And I want to share with you a few of these stories that you probably haven't heard of what happened in 1948 at the time of Israel's birth, some of the most epic Hollywood-like stories that you probably haven't heard of. And I learned of these in this brilliant book called Who Knew? I haven't been paid to promote this, but I've been reading it recently and it's by Jack Cooper, who's a former educator. And it's all about unusual stories in Jewish history. And it goes all the way back to ancient times up until modern day. But I want to share with you just three uh, sto short stories that he pointed out, historical uh, stories. So the first one is that a Swedish housewife made sure that Israel got its machine gun. Okay, let me read it to you. In the days following World War II, the Jews of Palestine were confident they would be given a state. They were also confident that the Arabs would attack and that they would have to defend themselves. With nations willing to sell arms to the Arabs and no one willing to sell arms to the Jews, a massive underground network was fashioned to overcome the, this disparity in armaments. Haim Slavin, a Russian-born Jewish immigrant to Palestine with a background in engineering, was sent to the United States to work on arms procurement. Through an American contract, he was put in touch with a semi-retired Swedish immigrant gunsmith named Karl Ekdal. Ekdal agreed to design a light submachine gun for the Jews for $17,000. Midway through the project, Ekdal came to Slavin and reported that an Egyptian group was offering $100,000 for the same job. Slavin told Ekdal that he understood uh, and, and that Karl was free to sell his expertise elsewhere if it would help his modest financial situation. Ekdal invited Slavin to his home to talk it over with his wife. When Ekdal was appraised of the situation, she asked two questions. Did her husband have a contract? And was Slavin living up to the terms? Receiving two affirmative answers, she said there was nothing to discuss and that Karl should get on with the job and fulfill his obligations to the Jews. Which, by the way, is true in halacha. That's what you do halachically. If you agree to something, you do it in, uh, in business. Number two, a film about New Zealand pilots helped Israel win a war. Now, this is just astonishing. Listen to this. After the end of the British mandate for Palestine, Israel was clandestinely searching all over the world for arms and fighter aircraft. Emmanuel Zur, an Israeli secret agent in London, had managed to obtain three bow fighter bombers and was trying to figure out how to get them out of England from under the watchful eye of the British. The answer came to Zur when a pilot he had hired introduced him to a New Zealand actress who subsequently agreed to star in a movie Zur would produce about New Zealand's role in World War II. Within a few days, Zur provided funds for the film documenting the courage exhibited by New Zealand pilots during the war. He then contacted people in the British film industry and organised a production company. The actors he hired were all real pilots. The final scene in the script called for a mass takeoff of the bow fighters. The cameras rolled and the planes took off on a one-way trip to Israel. <laughs> Remarkable. And the third story, the Syrians lost the same cargo twice. Listen to this. In April of 1948, in anticipation of the coming war with the Arabs, the Jews sank the Syrian arms ship Lino in the Barry Harbour of Italy. A few months later, uh, Ada Serini, the chief Israeli underground agent in Italy, received word from an Italian official that the Syrians were planning to retrieve the lost weapons from the bottom of the harbour. Miss Serini saw an inviting prospect of getting the arms and having the Syrians pay the salvage bill. Miss Serini contracted a, a trusted and well-paid shipping agent who was engaged to help the Syrians locate a vessel and crew. Everything went according to plan and the ship, the Agira, set out for Syria with the recovered arms and two crewmen, crewmen chosen by Ada. She then dispatched a fishing boat with two Israelis in Syrian army uniforms. The fishing boat soon caught up with the Agira, told them that the ship was in danger and asked to come aboard with some special communications equipment. Once aboard, the Israelis took over the ship, transferred the cargo and crew and scuttled the ship. Thus it was that the Syrians lost two ships while all the arms that they had purchased went to Israel. There are so many stories like this in the book, in this book and also beyond the book as well, um, just throughout Jewish history. Uh, Jewish history is an incredible tapestry 
of miracles, of seeming coincidences, of Jews cheating death time and time again. And in fact, by the way, that's what uh, um, it is said of the first Jewish child, Isaac. His ne- the Hebrew letters of his name can be rearranged to spell Kate's high, meaning death in life. Um, that's the Jewish people. The Jewish people are that burning bush, the bush that burns but is never consumed. And by doing this, by surviving and cheating death and surviving against all the odds and transforming the world in the process, we reveal the divine in this world. That is what God's chosen people have done. Hi, thank you so much for watching. To watch another one, click here. To stay up to date with all our content, click here to subscribe. And if you're able to, you can help support JTV to grow and grow by clicking join below this video, where you can become a member and get perks, including early access to videos and private live discussions with me. But most of all, you'll be partnering with us on our mission to change the world.